let me uh, welcome you all here this afternoon. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm Merit Jano, Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs, so I'm going to just get started and welcome you again for joining us at the very start of the academic year. Uh, I am really truly delighted to welcome Steve Case to campus. I think one of America's most respected entrepreneurs and also Secretary Liu, who is also a professor at SIPA. And I'll introduce them both a bit more in a second, but let me just first by thanking you and welcoming you. Thanks, right here. So this is our first major event uh, of the academic year, and it's a wonderful way to start. Uh, and indeed, I want to extend my appreciation to Columbia Entrepreneurship, with whom we have partnered uh, for today's gathering. I think students across the university and at SIPA are taking their policy passions, of course, into government and business and technology, but also taking those passions into entrepreneurship. And you see that more and more. Three years ago, we launched an initiative looking at the intersection of entrepreneurship policy and digital technologies, and thinking about the transformations that are happening in ecosystems, in cities, the role of universities, and how we can support that trend. So uh, no one, I think, was better to help us think about these developments than Steve Case. So really, I want to thank you for being with us. Of course, we all know of him as the co-founder of AOL and chairman and CEO of Revolution, a DC-based investment firm that he co-founded in 2005. Uh, to partner with entrepreneurs and to create businesses and find businesses and stimulate businesses across America. And he's also the author of a New York Times best-selling book, The Third Wave, An Entrepreneur's Vision of the Future, uh, which I think is a terrific read. I congratulate you on it. Um, and is uh, really uh, showing uh, how entrepreneurship, digital entrepreneurship, has changed the period that we're in compared with other periods. He's also chairman of the Case Foundation, which um, he established with his wife in 1997, and you've supported hundreds of organizations, um, initiatives and partnerships with a focus on the internet and entrepreneurship. I also want to welcome and thank Secretary Liu for being in this conversation. Of course, we know him as the 76th Secretary of the Treasury. He also served as the White House Chief of Staff to President Obama, Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, in the private sector, he was Managing Director and Chief Operating Officer at Citi Group, um, and also uh, had leadership positions at NYU, and uh, we're enormously grateful that he joined our faculty about a year ago, and wonderful to have you with us. So to get us started, Steve, would you share with us uh, how you started this initiative, what you've learned from it, where you think we're going, are we fixing our problems, are we creating entrepreneurship uh, really across America? Please help us learn from your uh, experience. Well, first of all, it's great to be back at uh, Columbia and New York, and particularly to uh, be with Jack, who was a big supporter of a lot of entrepreneurship initiatives when he was working for President Obama, both in terms of the chief of staff role and then obviously as the secretary of, of uh, treasury. So when we get to the Q&A period, the good news is all hard questions <laughs> go to Jack, all easy questions go to me. Just want to establish that coming in. Uh, in terms of the Rise of the Rest, uh, it's an initiative we launched a few years ago to really promote uh, innovation. The question really related to you know, this initiative uh, we launched called Rise of the Rest and what are we trying to accomplish and you know, how, how are things going and what are some of the you know, challenges m moving forward. We launched this initiative a number of years ago, probably four or four and a half years ago, to really shine a spotlight on you know, great entrepreneurs all over the country that are building great, potentially iconic breakthrough businesses all over the country, you know, but their stories are not uh, necessarily told, uh, and they have a much tougher time you know, raising the capital, particularly the venture capital they need to start and scale their companies. Uh, and if you look at the data, uh, it's pretty you know, sobering. Last year, 
75% of venture capital in the United States of America went to three states. California, New York, Massachusetts, 75%. Which means the other 47 states are fighting over 25%. These are pretty big states. And there are a lot of great, you know, great entrepreneurs in those, in those uh, you know, states. Last year, California alone got 50% of venture capital, one state. Last year, Ohio got less than 1%. Pennsylvania got less than 1%. Virginia got less than 1%. Michigan got less than 1%. Texas, everything's bigger in Texas. It's a little bit bigger. They got 2%. But the reality is entrepreneurs in California last year got every week in terms of venture capital what entrepreneurs and these other pretty big states got all of last year. And because of the work that uh, with the, the President and uh, Secretary Lou and others on uh, the Jobs Council that John Doerr was part of and Sheryl Sandberg and others, it was startling to me the connection between startups and job creation. The, the, not, the jobs aren't really created by the small business sector or the big business sector. It's by the young, high-growth startup sector, which doesn't mean it start, small business doesn't account for a lot of jobs. It, it does, but it doesn't account for a lot of net job growth. And similarly, the larger Fortune 500 companies as a sector, some are rising, some are falling. As a sector, it doesn't account for a lot of job growth. So most of the jobs are being created by the startups. And if we're, and it's not just the jobs within the startups, it's the ripple effect in the communities. For every startup job, there's five other jobs in the community, whether it be in construction or services or other things that are created. So if we're predominantly backing entrepreneurs in a few places that are doing disruptive things in the middle of the country, and we're not offsetting that, at least in part, by backing the entrepreneurs in those places that are creating companies in those places that can create jobs in those places, the divide we have in this country is gonna grow even deeper. So we have to, we think level the playing field in terms of uh, opportunity and make sure everybody everywhere really feels like they have a shot at the American dream. And the last point I make is, is it's, it's, it's a problem in terms of place, is 75% going to three states. It's actually worse if you look at people. Get this, last year, over 90% of venture capital in this country went to men, less than 10% to women. Last year, less than 1% went to African Americans. So this is a great entrepreneurial nation. I would argue still the most innovative entrepreneurial nation in the world. We should be proud of that. But if you look at the data, it's pretty sobering that it does matter where you live. It does matter what you look like. It does matter who you know. Whether well, if you have an idea, you have a shot at turning that into a company and really pursuing the American dream. Uh, and I don't think that's right from a fairness standpoint. I think we could all agree on that. But it's also not smart from a competitiveness standpoint. We need everybody on the playing field. We need every idea on the playing field, not just you know, you know, certain kind of people in certain kind of places. So that's why we launched this initiative. It's all about kind of trying to close this opportunity gap and, and level the playing field. And it's not only about venture capital, but we think that's a key ingredient uh, to create this more in inclusive innovation economy. Uh, the question is, what have you seen the kinds of interventions that help with this problem? I mean, Silicon Valley is getting so expensive that you know it's pricing itself a bit in, in ways that they're more, uh, I think uh, software engineers are moving to Colorado. There's, there's kind of a natural uh, movement uh, into certain innovation hubs around America, but are there policy interventions or other kinds of interventions that you think have made a difference uh, to help with some aspect of this? Yes, and I, I think it, ultimately it's the you know, entrepreneurs building the companies and, and, and you know, kind of as they, the ones that are successful, obviously not all are successful, the ones that are successful kind of are flourishing, creating lots of, you know, jobs. When, you know, Jeff Bezos was wandering across the country and had this idea of kind of selling books online and happened to settle in, in Seattle, most people didn't think that was that big an idea, but now they've gone on to, you know, create what's, you know, coming up on, a million jobs, and so you know, how do you make sure those ideas are are backed everywhere uh, is is a critical you know part of it. There's some things from a, and this is more in the secretary's kind of 
area of expertise, but there's some things from a policy standpoint you know, the government has done, including uh, under President Obama passing something called the Jobs Act five or six years ago, the Jump Starting Our Business Startups Act that modernized the securities laws that hadn't changed since 1933. That wasn't just pre-internet, that was like pre-television. The same laws in terms of raising money for companies hadn't changed since 1933. And the Jobs Act updated them, including being able to use the internet to you know, talk about companies and even crowdfunding to, to, to fund the equity crowdfunding to fund companies and created more of an on-ramp for young companies to go public so it was a little bit less burdensome up until then. It, essentially, a small company going public was treated exactly the same way as you know, largest companies in the, in, in the country. So the, you know, the Jobs Act was helpful and it was done in a, in a bipartisan way. More, most recently, as part of this tax reform, and there's obviously lots of complexities to the tax reform, there was a provision that I think was helpful called the Investing in Opportunity Act, uh, creating opportunity zones, which will create incentives around capital gains if you invest in, in, in the communities in our country that have you know, the greatest degree of, of poverty, and hopefully that will unleash some, some capital. So there's some things on the investment side. There are, of course, other things on the broader public policy side, including funding basic research. The ideas like the internet were funded by our government. DARPA, over a half century ago, basically created the internet. Uh, DARPA and other, other research agencies create a lot of the technologies we take uh, uh, for granted, GPS and other things that have unleashed a lot of innovation across a lot of different sectors. So continuing to fund basic research is important. Our level of funding has been going down, not up. So it's, uh, and other countries, particularly China, are accelerating their investments. So it's you know, a little bit uh, scary. And the other area that is, you know, that is uh, scary, in my opinion, uh, relates to immigration, you know, that this is, you know, part of the reason we're the kind of leader of the free world in this innovative nation is we've always welcomed people from all over the, you know, the world. And 40% of our Fortune 500 companies were started by immigrants or, or children of immigrants. And, and, you know, a lot of the, obviously, technology companies, that, that's even, it's even a little bit uh, you know, higher. And you know, we've made it more difficult for people to come, more difficult for people to stay. People are feeling uh, less welcome, and that likely will result in fewer people coming here and more people you know, going either staying where they are or going to other places, which ultimately will lead to some of the breakthrough companies of tomorrow, breakthrough industries of tomorrow, potentially being in other countries. And so obviously immigration is a complicated issue, kind of an emotional issue. It's, there are many facets to it, but we need to continue to win what's now a global battle for talent. Uh, or we are going to you know, lose our lead as the most innovative nation. So those are things only governments can do. Governments set tax policy and governments determine how much to allocate things like uh, basic research. Governments obviously uh, kind of figure out what the right you know, immigration you know, policies are. So if we don't get those things right, you know, I think we are going to be at risk. But even if we do get those things right, we also are at risk if we're you know, not providing a more inclusive approach to the kind of innovation that we're, we're funding, which is why we're you know, pushing forward on this kind of rise of the rest initiative. Jack, how do you think about this moment we're in and the health of the U.S. economy and its relationship to entrepreneurship? I don't know that the health of the economy at the moment is the most important question for entrepreneurship. Obviously, right now, we're approaching the 10th year of a period of economic growth. This should be a great time for entrepreneurs. Um, I think as long as the U.S. consumer is strong, as long as ideas are strong in the United States, as long as people are motivated to take risk and to take a shot at something, um, you know, whether the economy is doing a little better or a little worse is less the immediate issue. I agree very much with what Steve just said is ter in terms of what the kind of fundamental ingredients in terms of the policy environment are. Um, I would take a step back, though, and say that for an entrepreneur to be grown, uh, they need a basic elementary and secondary education that gives them the tools to get their advanced education, whether it's at a community college, a four-year college, or a graduate school. Um, we can't fall behind in the education race. And in, after 10 years of economic growth, I'm sorry to say we're losing ground in that competition. Um, what is it that's made the United States such a special place for innovation? We've had edu well-educated people with a real a desire to succeed, um, with access to research funded in large part by the federal government, 
Um, and a rule of law uh, that gave you the protection to know that if you had an idea and you succeeded, it was yours. Someone wasn't going to take it away from you. I mean, I spent years of my life going around the world preaching to other countries, you want to have an entrepreneurial economy like we have in the United States, you have to make sure people can count on keeping what they invent. Otherwise, they're going to go somewhere else to invent it. They won't invent it here. Um, I think we're falling behind a little bit on some of the basic um, human capital and infrastructure issues, which are um, uh, here in, in a tenth year of economic growth, we should be doing better on. Um, the, the fact that uh, we're in the process of restricting immigration is got two real direct impacts. One is what Steve pointed to, which is that the you know, people with the best education, best knowledge, aren't going to be here. Ironically, we train people here, and we can't keep them here when they want to work here, even when they have skills that we need. Um, but it's actually broader than that. Um, I think if you look at the history of entrepreneurship and first and second generations contributing to startups that became great, iconic companies, um, there's something about coming to this country to make a better life that's been part of the, the dynamism of entrepreneurship in America. If we kind of walk away from that as being part of the American dream, I don't think it bodes well for future uh, generations of, um, of entrepreneurship. Um, it, there, there's something about being comfortable uh, that's different than coming with a need to prove that you can make it here and a first generation that can't count on that lasting. So I think on human capital, um, both in terms of educating our own, uh, we should do, be doing better than we are. Um, in terms of being open to people who want to come part of it, I think we've been better in the past and I hope we get better at it. Certainly in the high skilled areas, I cannot tell you how many CEOs told me, I have jobs I can't fill. I need people for the jobs. And they weren't all CEOs of you know, multi-million employee companies. Some of them had 100 and 200. Um, I think infrastructure beyond that, um, you know, again, in, in, as we're kind of in the late stages of an economic uh, growth cycle, um, we should be doing better at, um, at repairing old technology. I mean, we can joke about the microphones not working, but sometimes, you know, our telecommunication system isn't working, and it's more like a third world than a, a leading first world system. Some of that requires government support. Some of it requires um, partnership. Um, but we can't fall behind. Um, I think you know, the, the, the challenge in, in the economy, the fundamental responsibility the government has is to maintain strong economic growth as long as you can, and beyond that, to make sure that we're fostering the building blocks for entrepreneurship, and that we don't get in the way um, uh, of ideas when uh, they emerge. Um, it's hard to get all those things right, and um, if we aren't doing it as well now, one has to worry if we're going to be able to catch up when we go into down cycle. So I actually worry more about going into a down cycle behind than, um, than, than I um, see uh, uh, the, 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 the current situation um, uh, as, as kind of defining uh, the future. Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the very interesting um, features of, of your book, Steve, was uh, in describing the evolution of this digital age and seeing a periodization and differences in the first set of digital entrepreneurs versus what you see as now this third wave as being rather different in character and having to have um, less garage-driven entrepreneurship, you argue, and more partnership in institutions, uh, the needing to partner with institutions to drive forward uh, this digital age. Could you share uh, some more about that kind of entrepreneurship? Yeah, sure. I, first, I should say, when I was in college um, in, uh, a bunch of years ago, 1979, uh, I read a book by Alvin Toffler called The Third Wave. Some of you may 
remember it, and I was mesmerized by it. He basically was talking, now this is 40 years ago, uh, about uh, the first way being the agricultural revolution, and that was followed by the second way, which is the industrial revolution, and he was predicting, positing, the third way was going to be this technology revolution, this digital revolution. And I remember reading that saying, I know that's going to happen. I, I know he's right. I want to be part of it. Uh, and when I graduated in 1980, I wanted to do that, but I couldn't because there were no internet companies to join at the time. It didn't yet exist. Uh, and there wasn't really a startup culture then, so I couldn't, you know, couldn't do my own thing. So I ended up working for some you know, big companies for a few years, Procter & Gamble and PepsiCo, and eventually kind of found my way into the, into, the, into, the, into the startup world. So I wanted to, when I came out with a book a couple years ago called The Third Wave, I, I, you know, I kicked it off by kind of referencing kind of the, the seminal experience in terms of reading the Toffler Third Wave. My version of the Third Wave was really the three waves of the internet. And the first wave was getting everybody online. When we started AOL in 1985, only 3% of people were online. And those 3% were online an average of one hour a week. It was a concept that was limited to a fringy kind of hobbyist audience. So we said we wanted to get America online. We were like, serious, that's what we're trying to do. At the beginning of that first wave of internet, just building the infrastructure, building the on-ramps, the servers, and the networks, and the software, and the modems, and the, everything that was you know, to, to get this going, uh, it went from kind of in, when it kicked off in the in the you know early to mid 80s to when it kind of at the end of that first wave, probably around the year 2000, it went from something that nobody knew about or cared about to something that everybody was connected to and couldn't live without. That was the first wave. That then set the stage for the second wave, which I'd argue is most of the last you know, two decades, which is because in that first wave, all the foundational infrastructure was built. You didn't need to work on that. So people focused on building software services apps on top of the internet, particularly on top of smartphones and Facebook and you know, all the things that you, you know, take for granted as part of your everyday life were part of that second wave. It was about software. The third wave is, I think, going to be integrating the internet in seamless and pervasive, sometimes even invisible ways throughout our lives and really change in, in a very fundamental, I think very helpful ways, uh, things like the healthcare system that desperately needs a, a different approach, our educational systems, some of the things that you know, Jack talked about, our food systems, uh, a lot of things around how we think about cities, particularly uh, smart cities. A lot of things are in play in the, in the third wave. But I think the mentality that you'll need to be successful in the third wave is different than the playbook of the second wave, but actually has some similarities to what we experienced in the first wave. And there are three Ps in particular that I think are worth uh, focusing on. Uh, first is perseverance. The second wave, there actually were a lot of overnight successes. Facebook and Snapchat, for example, they, they literally were started in a dorm and like a year later were you know, big successes. That never happened in the first wave. I don't think will happen in the third wave. You know, these are hard systems problems to deal with and it's gonna require perseverance. We used to you know, joke at AOL, although it wasn't really a joke, that we are a 10 year in the making overnight success. When in the mid to late 90s, the internet really took off, people said, oh, you guys you know, kind of came out of nowhere. No, we'd been working on it for more than a decade. Nobody was paying attention. Finally, it, it kind of you know, kicked in. So perseverance is gonna be you know, you know, critical. Partnerships are gonna be critical. You know, in, in the early days of the internet, we had 300 partners at AOL. PC companies, software companies, content companies, commerce companies, communications companies, we worked with everybody. That web of alliances is what made the you internet know, possible, certainly made you know, our success uh, you know, possible. Those partnerships were not really necessary in the, in the second wave. Snapchat didn't have any partners, they just had a cool app that suddenly got adopted virally. Um, so it, partnerships in the, in the third wave are critical. You're not gonna change healthcare by writing an app. You gotta get like nurses and doctors to embrace it and you gotta get hospitals to integrate it, you gotta get you know, insurance companies to pay for it, and, and you know, there are a bunch of things that are going to be required to, to make that work. And there's an African proverb that I think will define the third wave, which if you want to go quickly, you can go alone, but if you want to go far, you must go together.
So partnerships are key. And the final one, people don't like to hear this, uh, particularly the, you know, this disruptive entrepreneurs in places like Silicon Valley, but policy is going to be more important. Governments are going to be more important. Regulations are going to be more important. They were critically important in the first wave. People forget this. When we started AOL, it was illegal for consumers or businesses to connect to the internet. It was restricted to government agencies and educational institutions. So if you're a student at Columbia, you could use the internet. If you worked for the Treasury Department, you could you know, kind of use the internet. But if you're at home or at a business, you couldn't use the internet. That required congressional action to commercialize the internet. Also, a judicial decision to break up AT&T, Ma Bell, the monopoly phone company, unleashed a torrent of investment and innovation and competition that basically made the, you know, the internet uh, possible. So and I could go down other issues. Policy was critical in that first wave. Again, not that critical in the second wave. Now that some of these companies like Facebook or Google are so successful, now there is more government scrutiny but they actually didn't need to get laws passed uh, to basically break into the, into the uh, market. In the third wave, again, going, using healthcare as an example, of course there are going to be regulations about drug safety, medical device safety. In transportation, of course there are going to be regulations about how driverless cars work or drones flying in the skies you know, work. You know, of course there are going to be issues, you know, issues around food safety. And it's like, you may not like it, but as, as an entrepreneur, but you certainly like it as a citizen. Like if you're like a parent, you don't want like the drone to crash in your kid's playground or the food they eat at school to you know, make them sick. Of course there are gonna be some, you know, some regulations and the entrepreneurs understand that and embrace this idea of perseverance, embrace the idea of partnerships, embrace the, you know, the importance of, of policy are gonna be the ones I think are gonna be you know, successful in this third way. Final point I'll make, as it ties back to the rise of rest. The first wave of the internet was regionally distributed. Our company, AOL, was in the DC area. Hayes, the big communications modem company, was in Atlanta. Sprint, another communications company, was in you know, Kansas City. Microsoft actually started in Albuquerque and then moved to Seattle. Dell started in Austin. IBM's PC operations were Boca Raton, Florida. Gateway was in you know, North Dakota. I could give you dozens of other examples. That first wave of the internet happened all across the country. It was the second wave when it was just about software that Silicon Valley rose to dominance. In the third wave, I believe expertise around these sectors are gonna be critical. Obviously, as I said, partners are gonna be critical. I wouldn't be surprised if the most innovative ag tech companies and you kind know, of revolutionized farming are in places like St. Louis and Lincoln and Louisville. I wouldn't be surprised some of the most innovative health companies are in places like Baltimore, where John Hopkins and Under Armour is, or Cleveland, or where there's a lot of expertise in, in these different uh, uh, you know, sectors. One of the most innovative cities now in terms of smart cities is Columbus, Ohio. So I think you'll see this third wave you know, kind of regionalize again, but only if the venture capitalists sitting on the coast, you know, go to the effort of actually getting on a plane, you know, some of them say, if I can't drive to the company, I'm not interested. Some actually say, if I can't bike to the company, I'm not interested. I would suggest that's leaving a lot of great ideas, a lot of great entrepreneurs, you know, kind of aside, and it's a missed opportunity for them as investors. It's also a missed opportunity for, I think, for our country. Thank you very much. I wonder, Jack, you have, um you know, you, you have thought about risk a lot and also how um, the intersection of regulation and, you know, innovation and dynamism can coexist. You know, we've seen sector after sector be disrupted by technology. Um, how do you see this relationship between, um, I mean, what's been interesting to me is, is the, the receptivity to the driverless car. I was actually expecting more regulatory resistance, but with data around safety, there was a certain receptivity as that data gets more complicated, you know, other concerns stimulate. But how do you see the relationship between, you know, disruptive innovation and, and sort of regulatory tolerance for the messiness until clarity reveals itself? Using the, the kind of model that Steve has outlined, in, in the second stage, um, it was so much about um, software and information that there was a kind of free speech aspect to the government staying away from what was going on. 
Um, that's not the case once you get into these applications that transform sectors of the economy that are already uh, appropriately subject to regulation. So I went through you know, the, the years I was at the Treasury Department dealing with quite a few disruptive technologies that were coming through. And the challenge that we faced was how do you encourage innovation and get out of the way for things that you would never develop in a government policy shop but that might be the answer to how we do business in the future without um, saying we don't care about the normal protections of either safety and soundness or consumer protection. When do you kind of cross the line? I think the difference between, you know, say, social media and fintech is that fintech knows it's working in a heavily regulated space. Drug manufacturers know they're working in a heavily regulated space. So the question kind of shifts from is there an appropriate role for government to how do you design an appropriate response that doesn't treat everything the same? You, know, don't, you don't want to be a hammer where everything is a nail. Um, I'll give you an example in the, in the fintech space. One of the things I spent a lot of time working on was having uh, financial access uh, increase, that we have too many people who are unbanked. I personally believe that the solution to that is more likely going to be found through technology than bricks and mortar. It's just too expensive to bank small accounts in bricks and mortar. So you can give people a card that gives them the ability to you know, save, that gives them the ability to develop a financial history, that gives them the ability to ultimately be able to get a loan. So maybe when they have an entrepreneurial idea, they can actually get financing for it. But once you start paying interest on the money that people are putting away, when does that card become a financial institution? And I remember convening regulators to have discussions about it, and there were different views. You know, one view was if you're going to get into a space where you're going to ultimately seek the protection of the federal government through quasi-insurance, then you better be a full-blown FDIC-insured institution. That probably would have strangle the development of th this new technology that ultimately will give people more access to the financial system. There's got to be a reasonable balance. And if you're making a mortgage, you have to abide by you know, fair credit reporting rules and you, know, you have to have underwriting rules that are com comparable or similar to the brick and mortar institution rules. On the other hand, you don't want the government coming in and saying, if you can issue mortgages with virtually no paperwork, we're going to treat you like a bank for all reasons, with reserves, with, with um, oversight of the highest level. How do you set the dial right? I actually think that as I watch the, the social media companies resist government um, intrusion, at one level, I'm sympathetic because I don't want the government making a lot of rules about free speech. On the other hand, um, I see in other sectors, whether it's transportation or finance or um, in pharmaceuticals, where accepting that you have to be in a conversation about how to do it makes it much more likely it will be done right. My fear in the social media space is it's going to happen. At some point, there's going to be um, uh, sufficient um, aggregation of information, there already is sufficient aggregation of information, to have a degree of market power and control that if it were in a traditional economy would certainly be subject to certain oversight. If, that, if we wait too long before we do it in a measured way, I worry about overshooting the mark and kind of stifling innovation because the challenge is how do you provide enough room that you don't get in the way while appropriately asking our traditional concerns being addressed in this new context. And that's hard. It's hard for regulators. It's hard for businesses. Um, I think it's telling that it's been so slow in coming in the social media space. Um, and um, yeah, my own view is that the sooner it's done in a sensible way, the more likely we are to avoid have it being done in an unsensible way. 
It's a very hard problem to solve in a sensible way, isn't it? And where is the driver for it? I mean, can the companies self-regulate, uh, you think, to, uh, to identify the interventions that would make a difference, or do you need a government to, uh, to set some of the, the pathways? Um, I actually think self-regulation um, would show us self-awareness of the issue and you know, would probably um, start to bound what the more formal uh, intervention would ultimately be. Um, uh, if it becomes kind of the Wild West where there are no rules, that's when you're just going to see, you know, we've seen it before. We've seen it um, when there's a crisis, like an Enron collapse, and we rewrite the securities laws, the you know, accounting rules, you know, almost overnight. We see it, you know, after a 9-11, when we see a Patriot Act that, you know, had you know, every idea that anyone had ever thought of to deal with the problem. You could see that in the, in the information technology space at some point, if there's not a more thoughtful way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I don't have the answer. It's not my area of expertise. I've actually thought it's an area where there needs to be much more investment both in academic institutions and in business uh, uh, institutions in thinking about the solution so that it doesn't end up coming from on high. i just add that, uh I earlier mentioned that the third wave of the innovators would be the small companies or the larger companies need to be more respectful of the role of policy. But as, as Jack said, it's also critically important that the folks on the government side uh, are respectful of the need to allow things to, to, to move. In the early days of the, the internet, I think the government got it right. They basically made the uh, investment, as I mentioned, to, kind of create the internet. And then for the first uh, wave and, and a good part of the second wave kind of said, we're gonna have a light touch to regulation, don't know exactly how it's gonna work, but let's just kind of let it run. You know, it's premature to put, you know, too much uh, kind of regulation on. So figuring out kind of how to strike that balance, Jack said, I think is gonna be you know, critically important. There is a fear, understandable fear, on the part of the entrepreneurs that, you know, the regulators will generally, because that's kind of what, they do keep bad things from happening as opposed to enable good things to happen. And you need to strike the right you know, balance there. You know, the, basically regulators get called in front of Congress when something bad happens and why do you let that drug get approved or why did you allow this? That's usually where they are under attack. So understandably, they're kind of cautious and risk averse and trying to keep bad things from happening. But you know, the innovation, world requires kind of taking risk and uh, also while recognizing the downsides also recognizing the upside that was a key part of the discussion we both were involved in when this you know jobs act passed the the congress there were concerns that the internet was used to raise money because of the risk of startups that could end up being a bad thing people would end up losing money on some investments which was absolutely true but what also was true if you were able to fund a bunch of entrepreneurs who otherwise wouldn't be funded, and some of those companies were successful and created a lot of jobs, it would seem like the benefits of that outweighed the risks. And getting that benefit-risk uh, equation right, I think, is critically important, particularly as we move into this you know, third wave. It's made more complicated by the fact that you know, our political system right now, I would argue, is broken. You know, I'm pretty independent. I, I kind of just want to, like, can't we all just get along and get stuff done? But the reality is, both on the Democratic side and the Republican side, things are moving more and more apart, and, and there is less of a, a willingness to compromise. Even some people say compromise is like a bad word. It means you have no principles. I think compromise is kind of pretty fundamental to a functioning democracy. And so on the legislative side, we're kind of at a standoff on a lot of things. Uh, and on the regulatory side, there's a real risk of not getting this balance right. And if I was, you know, if I had to predict what would lead to potentially this country losing its lead as the, you know, kind of most innovative you know, nation, it would be those issues around governance. You know, if we don't get, you know, that right, I think we are, you know, really at, uh, at, at considerable risk. I would just add, it's worth noting that the Jobs Act was 
the principal sponsor in the House was the Republican majority leader, Eric Cantor, and we quietly negotiated it between you know, a Democratic White House and a kind of arch opponent on so many other issues because we agreed that something had to be done here. Um, I'm not sure it enhanced his standing in his own party that he did business with us. Um, it, 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 we've got to get over the idea that you're somehow violating a core principle if you reach out on things you can agree on and then disagree on, uh, on other things. Well, let me take you back to where we are right here, which is, you know, a great research university. And as you think about entrepreneurship, um, I think it's often linked uh, to places in America or places around the world where there are great research universities. You know, we're trying to spawn uh, innovation, and there are a lot of companies that come out of research universities. And I think there's a great deal of, of efforts by different cities in America to ask, what can we do to work with universities or to support entrepreneurs? And you're seeing this close up. So could you sh share a little bit of insight about, uh, A, what you think universities could be doing more of, uh, and what you think cities are doing that are interesting to support entrepreneurship? Well, on the university side, it sounds like Columbia is a great example because there's more and more of a focus on entrepreneurship and, and, and trying to integrate that across a lot of different you know, kind of parts of the university. The great thing about a place like Columbia, it attracts a lot of really smart people who have a desire to change the world. And so it's a magnet for, for talent. It also is a place where experiments happen in a variety of different, different uh, fields. And some of those things can move from being experiments in a lab somewhere uh, into the marketplace. And some of the greatest you know, innovations have, have come from that. So it's critically important. And we, not surprisingly, the cities in, around the country that are most on the rise do have kind of a, a strong university. You know, Carnegie Mellon, for example, in, in Pittsburgh. You know, Pittsburgh kind of powered the Industrial Revolution with sort of the steel capital. Carnegie Mellon arguably is the best university around robotics research. Not surprisingly, Uber, pretty iconic Silicon Valley company, is actually doing most of its driverless car you know, innovation, not in Silicon Valley, but in Pittsburgh. Uh, there's enormous things happening in, in Ann Arbor and other great uh, university around mobility and other, other kinds of things. You know, all across the, the country, there are these, 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 uh, you see these stories. What's happened, though, in most of those cities and with most of those universities, and maybe Columbia is a little bit different, is it attracted the people there, but then they all left. There's a huge brain drain from the last half century. This, you know, one of the stories of America is a story of, of, of people moving to opportunity, uh, and in many cases, that means leaving the place they grew up or the place they went to, to school. So the smart people everywhere, creativity everywhere, but not every opportunity everywhere. And as a result, people, you know, and not surprisingly, with very rational, move to where the the opportunity is. As we start backing more of these entrepreneurs, as these cities, you know, begin to. Uh, to rise as universities work more collaboratively with the, you know, the businesses and the mayors and others, which we're starting to see, that I think we'll start to see the slowing of the brain drain of people leaving uh, and also the beginnings of a boomerang of talent of people returning. And last week I was in Silicon Valley speaking at this uh, uh, TechCrunch you know, conference and there was a, a thousand or so people in the audience. And I asked the question, how many of you, by a show of hands, grew up here? It was broadly defined as Bay Area. It was less than 5%. It might even be closer to 1%. I couldn't see all the hands. But the reality is almost everybody in Silicon Valley is from some other place. And they went there because that's where the opportunity was, in part because that's where the money was, in part because that's where other people doing innovative things was, and which made sense. But how do we create that dynamic in more parts of the country so people still want to be in San Francisco or want to be in New York or want to be in Boston, all of which are great uh, entrepreneurial regions, will continue to be great entrepreneurial regions. They should be. But they actually rather be in Ohio or Wisconsin or where have you. Uh, and that's actually where they'd like to kind of stake their claim and raise their family and build their business. How do you make sure they have that opportunity as well, which is will, we think, have the potential to close this opportunity gap, create more you know, more jobs in, in more parts of the, you know, the country and have more people in more parts of the country actually have a reason to 
be optimistic about the future as opposed to kind of skittish and, and fearful about the future. This notion of disruption that we celebrate in Silicon Valley basically means job loss to them. That's the reality. And, and that's going to happen. It's just the nature of disruption. 200 years ago, over 90% of us worked on farms. Now it's less than 2%. Because of technology, disruption. You could grow more food with fewer people. Thankfully, we followed that agricultural revolution with the industrial revolution. And then when that started subsiding, followed that with the you know, technology revolution. So this notion of innovation, technology, disruption impacts jobs and, and destroys jobs. Of course, that's the case. That's not the question. The question is, are we going to be able to offset the job loss by creating jobs in the industry of the future? And are we going to do that all across the country so everybody feels part of the future or only in a few places on the coast, which will lead to an even greater divide between the people who feel like they're valued and have a role in the future and the people who don't. And I've realized that you know jobs are obviously about income and supporting your family, and that's like super important. But it's also about dignity and purpose and respect. So we have to do everything we can to create as many jobs as we can in as many sectors as we can for as many people as we can as quickly as we can. Uh, or the divide that we see today is going to get worse and worse, and I'm not smart enough to know what the consequences of that. Other people, you know, Jack, or other people in the room probably will. But I know it would be really, really bad. So how do we avoid you know, getting to that you know, point? Mm -hmm. America, can I just make two points uh, following on, on what we do well? I was struck, I, when I was secretary, I would travel to a city and I would visit businesses. I would go and try and see things that we were doing on the ground. And I visited manufacturing hubs in a bunch of cities. In some of the states that you're describing is overlooked, in, in Ohio and Virginia. And I was struck that um, where you had universities, community colleges, and businesses sitting together talking about what they wanted to do, the universities would direct some of their research to solving some of the engineering problems that the entrepreneurs knew they needed to solve but didn't have the engineering departments to solve. The community colleges would train some of the workforce so that the entrepreneur could know that if they needed 50 or 100 people with a set of skills, they can get the first 90% and do the last 10% on the job, which is what you always do when a really specialized uh, knowledge. And it was really quite you know, uplifting to see that in some of the forgotten places, you actually can do it right when you get everyone together. Now, we didn't do it all over the country, and there's a certain beggar thy neighbor character to it because, you know, I was in a, a manufacturing hub in Richmond, um, and people were thrilled because by putting this combination together, they had drawn a jet engine business into, into Virginia that had previously been in the UK. Now, did it create new jobs? Did it take jobs from the UK? If your goal is to grow the U.S. economy, being a magnet to do it fair and square, playing by the rules, felt like it was more good than bad. Um, we look at uh, what government is doing not well, and I think we saw it was not being done well, and it's now even less well. We've allowed uh, the economy to become a kind of winner-take-all economy. When you have less and less people uh, working to produce the same amount of goods, when you have the successful entrepreneurs becoming you know, fabulously wealthy, we have a tax code that allows you to let a lot of the gain go virtually untaxed forever. Um, when we worry about how are we going to pay for making opportunity available, how are we going to pay for training, how are we going to pay for community colleges, how are we going to pay for child care so people can go to work, we also have to ask what are we doing in terms of making sure that, that we look to you know, the tax code and ask, you know, is it doing its job? I think it's fundamentally broken now. Um, you know, when you see how much of the wealth of the country goes in the form of unearned income that escapes taxation, I'm not saying people are doing something wrong when they take advantage of a tax code that permits it. 
but it's up to policymakers to ask the question, how do we fix the tax code? Not to say we don't have the money to do any of the things we need to do to expand opportunity. Mm -hmm. I make one point, building on Jack said about these kind of forgotten places, which is, it's worth remembering that some of these now forgotten places are what some people call the Rust Belt or flyover country, which are terms I find objectionable. objectionable. These are the places that built America. And, and, and there's a you know, arc of history here that is, is kind of worth remembering. First of all, it's worth remembering like 250 years ago, America itself was a startup. It was just an idea. And a pretty fragile idea that almost didn't make it. And then we led the way in the agriculture revolution, industrial revolution, technology revolution, as I said before. That's why we kind of rose up. So what happened as, as that happened? Uh, many of the cities uh, that are, were the most innovative cities 100 years ago kind of lost their edge. Take Detroit. We've both been to Detroit a number of times. 100 years ago, Detroit was Silicon Valley. It was the most innovative city in the country. People were moving, the car was the technology of the moment. Everybody wanted to be part of the car revolution. People moved there, houses being built, roads being built, schools being built, libraries being built, growing like crazy. And it did lead the way for a half century. And then kind of lost its entrepreneurial mojo, a bunch of things happened. Uh, and in the last half century, lost 60% of its population and then went bankrupt. And it was Silicon Valley. What was Silicon Valley 100 years ago? Fruit orchards. Fruit. It wasn't growing startups. It was growing fruit. So a city that was the leader of the pack fell by the wayside. It's by the way, fighting its way back. And we've been doing a number of things. We have a half a dozen investments in Detroit. And there's one company we backed two and a half years ago. It was two people. Now it's 400 people in downtown Detroit. So it's showing real momentum. But it kind of lost its edge, lost its way. So these are cities that we should celebrate because of the role they played in the past, but recognize it's not some historical novel. They can play a critical role in the future in these sectors that are ripe for disruption. They have a lot of the expertise that's necessary. They have the potential for partnerships, but we've got to make sure that people recognize that and stay there or go there, and the investors recognize that and back those ideas. And that's what, obviously, we're trying to do with this Rise of the Rest. If you compare Detroit and Pittsburgh, you actually see the difference of when government and academic institutions play an effective role earlier. Pittsburgh's probably 15, 20 years ahead of Detroit in bouncing back because there was a more enlightened approach. You can't hold on to the past. You have to be part of the future. So there's you know, high technology. There's biomedical research replacing uh, the steel industry as the main employer and the driver of the Pittsburgh economy. Uh, I think De Detroit, thank goodness, is finally coming back, but it went through decades of denial, um, which really hurt Detroit. Well, I'm curious, you know, as you uh, go to these areas that need to be revitalized, but you see something there, uh, you know, that can be activated, what gets it going? I mean, you're giving visibility, you're doing hackathons, you're doing prizes. These are, are, are tools, if you will, to, to, you know, to attract capital and motivate people. And is it doing that? No, we're making progress, but we recognize we have, as I mentioned, the data from last year, 75% of venture capital going to three states. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do to try to kind of level that playing field. But, and, and there are a bunch of aspects to it. As I said, the capital is part of it. This talent piece is critically important. Driving more collaboration, partnerships, cross-sector you know, partnerships, Jack said about in, in Pittsburgh. So the universities are working with the, the mayor's office. Work, the big companies are working with the, the small companies. A lot of what we do when we're in these cities is kind of convene and connect people. That, you know, we shouldn't have to do that because like, we're not from there. But every single city we've been to, we've made introductions with people that actually are doing things that are interesting that other people in that same city don't know about. So some of it is kind of creating more of that network density and more of that connection, more of that collaboration uh, uh, locally. Another area that's a, a, a challenge that, that, that needs, needs a lot of work is one of the great things about Silicon Valley is its fearlessness, the sense that anything is possible. 
Uh, there are a lot of communities in this country that are kind of risk averse, kind of cautious, kind of more focused on why something might not work as opposed to why it might work. And you know, kind of that mindset, you know, it, it, it needs to, needs, needs work. So there's a bunch of things that need to happen. This, this is not a, you know, easy thing. It's going to take a lot of years uh, to, to reverse, you know, kind of what's, what's happening. I'm optimistic it can happen and obviously doing everything I can to try to push it to happen, accelerate it to happen. But there's no question that there's a, there's a, it's a big challenge to make sure these, each of these cities do in fact connect, do in fact, you know, win the battle for talent, the battle for capital, create more of a sense of, of possibility. I should say on Silicon Valley, because I've mentioned it a bunch of times, I love Silicon Valley. It, it is the pride of America and the envy of the world and will continue to be. I just don't think it's smart for us to be putting all our bets on the people in Silicon Valley versus spreading the bets more broadly uh, across the country. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for your efforts. And, and one reads actually a lot of excitement at these forums. I'd like to open it up for questions and comments. Yes, please, why don't you get us started? Ah. Hi. Uh, I, read, I didn't read Toffler, but I did see him on a lot of bookshelves. But I want to talk about a, a prescient uh, public intellectual from an earlier generation that we probably have all read, George Orwell and um, regarding the use of technology for nefarious purposes, which is going on in uh, increasingly authoritarian states around the world. And it's, it, to me, it's really a tragedy because these same countries have vital intellectual capital and entrepreneurial spirit, and yet what I'm seeing going on with surveillance and, and, and such, you really could have an Orwellian-type future. And, um, trying to, to wrest the control of the internet out of U.S. hands. So just any comments on, on the dangers of um, the misuse of technology and how we can, you know, keep the vitality of a global intellectual ecosystem without uh, threatening the, fu the future? No, I think the risks are significant. I think, obviously, I'm a big fan of the internet, and I, I, I can give you a laundry list of benefits that it had in terms of people's lives and, and you know, economic development and so forth. But there's no question there's, there's risks. And as you said, the Orwellian you know, kind of view of things is, is a real risk. Part of the reason you know, policy regulatory issues are going to be more important in this third wave is, is things like smart cities are incredibly exciting. The ability to you know, move people around in smarter ways that, you know, and, and have just smarter cities in, in every respect is incredibly exciting. Uh, at the same time, there are risks. And, and you know, cyber terrorism, for example, is a risk. And being able to, you know, people were able to bring a company down, not quite down, but Sony was under siege. You know, if you could bring a, a city down or a, a country down, that's, that's a big risk. I know Jack's worked on, on, on some of those issues. The other area, which is there's an unintended consequence that has been uh, surprising to me and, and disappointing to me, is I really believed in those early days of the Internet and how it would kind of level the playing field in terms of access to information and give everybody a voice. And it has. But now we have, because everybody has a voice, you know, some issues with what some people have called filter bubbles, where people are only listening to people they agree with and not really understanding the other side, the whole phenomenon around fake news and other things. You know, Senator Moynihan from, you know, this uh, state you know, famously said everybody's entitled to their own opinion but not their own set of facts. On the Internet, there are a lot of people with their own set of facts. And so there definitely are some issues where even though there's tremendous benefits, there's also uh, tremendous risks, and we just need to be, you know, understand that and engage and try to strike that right balance. First of all, thank you so much for lending me your microphone. Secondly, um, I'm curious uh, to learn from the three of you. Most of the time we are talking about disruptive innovation and we see that every time we talk about uh, entrepreneurship, it's about creating apps or uh, technology. We don't uh, think uh, of entrepreneurship in terms of cultural or uh, social uh, things that can, can, be, can fix real problems, not only to put an app to make our life easier, but also how you, how some, any of you mentioned, how you find the ripple effect in the community. Nowadays, we are facing a lot of challenges regarding uh, education and health. And every time I see a conversation about entrepreneurship, it's all about technology. 
and know how to close the gap uh, of certain people that have access to certain information that others cannot, uh, or certain resources that others cannot. So in a way, you as a founder of uh, the first wave, do you see in the future that entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs will get into uh, real issues in order to solve a social problem as McDonald did one day in, in, in the days? Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I think, and some of, some of what I was uh, trying to say around the third wave, I think those are dealing with some of the most fundamental problems or, or opportunities we have, how we stay healthy, how we learn, how we move around, how we, you know, what we eat. These are pretty, pretty fundamental things, and they've changed a little bit in the first wave and a little bit more in the second wave, but I think we'll change a lot more in the third wave. So I think the focus will be, if you will, on more uh, kind of real world, you know, kind of problems and not just on the apps. Of course, I'm not dissing the apps. There are a lot of great apps out there, but I think as you make this shift into the third wave, there's a uh, potential for even more societal impact. I, I, I don't think entrepreneurship is limited to technology. Um, I mean, certainly uh, when you look at, at basic services, um, it, technology is a way of delivering information to people, to get connecting people to services, but ultimately somebody has to be there providing your health care. They have to drive a car and give you a lift. So it's not an either or. It, uh, it, technology has become the medium through which we access real things in the economy, and entrepreneurs are finding ways to combine the, 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 the technology with providing the services. Thank you. Over here, please. Hi. Uh, my name is Samantha, and uh, I am an entrepreneur. I'm the founder of the uh, social and civic engagement platform for New York City millennials. Um, so we help millennials connect with leaders, in the nonprofit sector, um, business, and most importantly, government. One of the things that I have really found is that there is both a generational disconnect and a industry knowledge disconnect between tech entrepreneurs and government officials. Sometimes, you know, you're even using lingo that doesn't exactly match up. Um, how do you propose or think that we're capable of bridging this communication gap so that the policies that are being passed are ones that are not uh, negatively affecting organizations like Aren't You Going? I, I think it depends a lot what sector you're going to look at. Um, my experience in financial technology has been very different than that that the entrepreneurs who, who see that they're going to be successful s start asking questions, how do we manage through that system so that it doesn't become an obstacle? I think if, you know, as I was saying before, I think in the information uh, you know, uh, sector, in, 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 in social media, it's the other extreme. Um, and as Steve said, I don't think in healthcare anyone is questioning that the same safety rules and, and um, testing rules will apply if you're in an online business or uh, an old-fashioned brick-and-mortar pharmaceutical. So I think it really does depend on, on sectors. And um, the largest social media companies kind of are what everyone focuses on. But there's a lot of things going on around that. i just add that the, uh, I think this, last wave of innovation has been awesome, uh, but some people may have overlearned the lessons of some of, some of, the, some of the successes. I'll use Uber as an example. Great company, you know, kind of a, a, a breakthrough iconic company, you now has a global footprint, but you often hear people say uh, what they did that was really smart was they ignored the laws on the books. They just launched. And they built a critical mass of drivers and riders, and then they had essentially kind of a lobbying force in each city to get the rules changed. That is true. What's also true is they were able to do that because the regulations were very city by city. 
That's not the way it works in, in healthcare, for example. That's not the way it works in financial services. That's not the way it works in, in, in food safety. They're more of a national, not just our country, but you know, other countries. And in, in Europe, it's even more of a EU Brussels kind of you know, decision-making you know, body. And a company that's found that out the hard way is Theranos, that three years ago was worth $9 billion, is now bankrupt because they decided to be disruptive and to, I don't know all the details, but from what's been reported, basically you know, promised things that they couldn't deliver and put people's lives at risk and it's out of business. And so I think that's going to, you know, that dynamic in this third way, where do you fight your battles and how do you engage in a constructive way when it's appropriate? And there may be times where you have to you know, certainly push the, push the boundaries or maybe even try to get, you know, laws changed. But I think trying to you know, think that the way to innovate in this third wave is to ignore the laws that exist uh, are going to get you in a lot of trouble if you're focused on these aspects of our lives that are so fundamental uh, where there are, are regulations for a reason. Again, I get mad at these regulations too. I mean, they, I, I, I'm like a, an entrepreneur who wants to move quickly. And these regulations often slow you down. But I do know there's a reason why they're there. And I do respect the people that are managing those things, trying to strike the right balance. Thank you. Why don't we collect a couple of questions, if you don't mind? And since the mic is working over there, please, uh, why don't you go forward and then we'll come over here. Thank you, Steve. I love your work. I was a diehard entrepreneur out of college. I was on Jay Leno with a similar concept to the electronic cigarette. I won an award inventing a mobile coupon app before the app store came out. And I met a company that copied a ton of my inventions, made millions, and I was like, what am I going to do to get help? And I met with the attorneys. They wanted $50,000 a month retainer. And I'm just wondering, not to be negative, America is a great place to have to grow a startup, but 300 billion a year is lost to our economy and over 1.2 million jobs because of piracy, intellectual property theft, and then the average independent inventor, small business, you know, th then when if they get infringed or copied, a lot of times these attorneys they want like, like unless you got two, three million dollars to fight, you pretty much you're out of luck. Is there something that we can do to help prevent IP theft or to make mediation? more possible, or, or is there any solutions you see in the future to help reduce that challenge that startups sometimes face? They put their life energy and savings into something, and then a bigger company comes along or sometimes copies, and it's not always an easy battle. And Steve, I developed a new search engine prototype. Right. I have no. a pro I love, I was wondering if I could give you an executive summary. No, no pitches. <laughs> I wow. always get pitches. Yeah. I, I, I. We want to hear multiple questions. You want me to wait? Uh, just just what you're about. Yeah, thank you. I think, uh, obviously, the concern you raise is a legitimate one. I actually think the, the intellectual property protections, patent protections are better here in this country than most other parts of the, the world, and I think we need to make sure we have the right uh, incentives. But also, it, you know, I've learned you know, sometimes the hard way, and Thomas Edison said this a century ago, one of America's most revered inventors, uh, that vision without execution is hallucination. So having a good idea is the starting point, but you gotta execute against that idea before somebody else does uh, and, 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 and kind of win in the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think this is a really interesting time in this country because like you mentioned, uh, our government is failing on one side and kind of broken. And on the other side, we have all this technological innovation and we have this great source of uh, progress. So increasingly, I hear people talk about having technical solutions for government problems, right? We talked about healthcare a little, and so I hear that a lot. And I'm wondering, are we getting to a point where technology is trying to take the place of government? And there are words for that, like technocracy. Um, and so I just wonder if there's a way to harness all of this innovation on the technology side and use it to help government without kind of crossing those uh, streams. Well, Jack obviously has more expertise in this, but I would say there, the challenges, as I said before, that I think we face as a country from a governance standpoint is 
a lot has to do with the incentives being to not cooperate as opposed to you know, cooperate. And there are some structural things that a lot of people are, have been working on for a number of years in terms of redistricting other things that probably are helpful. I agree that sometimes you know, the people that come from the technology world believe that every problem, if you just sprinkle a little technology pixie dust on it, the problem will go away. And there, a lot of these problems have very little to do with the uh, uh, technology. Different ways to think, building you know, coalitions to kind of get things done in a different way strike me as the, the better solution. You want to add to that? Look, I, I don't think technology has a life of its own where it's going to take over government. Technology is really a tool that either will be used wisely or unwisely. And it's a powerful tool, so in the wrong hands, it could do harm. Um, we're not going to fix our healthcare system because there's some app that, um, that defines what best practices are. Our system will need to accept it. That means that hospitals and doctors are going to need to accept it. It means that the whole regulatory framework by which we assure that, that things are sound practices accept it. Um, do I think that sharing information is going to help us solve our healthcare problems? Yes. Um, but it's not going to happen on its own, and it's only going to happen through the kind of buy-in that you get uh, through ultimately a political process where uh, decisions are made. Um, I think if we could spend more time as a country figuring out how to do that and less time on some of the things we're spending our time on now, we'd be quite wise to, to shift our attention. Steve, Secretary Lew, it's a pleasure to hear from you guys. And Steve, obviously a big fan, but also as we're co-investors in a company called The Wing, uh, used to be in the venture capital world at Brand Foundry, so go them, Audrey and Lauren. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about a lot of great cities and areas in the United States that are really thriving in entrepreneurship and bring money back into it. And I think there's a territory I visited two years ago through the entrepreneurship community and visited recently that is overcoming just complete messes, which is Puerto Rico. And I've been seeing a lot, everything from the world of agriculture to now the crypto world has been tapping into it. And I have a question for both of you and uh, for you as, for as well, for the entire panel, about where you guys seeing uh, and if you're seeing anything across where Puerto Rico is coming through, because everything from tax incentives for entrepreneurship to what's going on with the blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, crypto kind of space to it, and as well as if you have any thoughts. And my reverse pitch to you is that I have a lot of friends in the investment space from there, if that's ever helpful for the Rise of the Rest Fund, um, just because I think it just makes natural sense. But I'd love to get your guys' thoughts on what you've been seeing. I spent a lot of time working on Puerto Rico uh, when I was at the Treasury Department because uh, there was no federal agency that was responsible for Puerto Rico, but we knew we were going to be responsible if they failed. And we just stepped in and, and did whatever we could to provide support. There's no question but that changing the tax laws so that Puerto Rico wasn't the equivalent of an offshore tax haven shifted investment in technology and pharmaceuticals away from Puerto Rico. It wasn't a great tax law. Um, it was part of tax reform that took it away. Um, it probably was an unintended consequence that it left the island in a place where most of the economic energy was over time drained out of it. I don't know that the answer is to create another tax haven. Um, the, you know, the challenge gets back to the same challenge we face in every other part of the country. How do you educate people? How do you manage resources well? How do you give people access to opportunity? And the problem in Puerto Rico now is they're in a state of economic decline where there's a brain drain and people who have skills are leaving and people who are um, able to build an economy are leaving and those who are dependent are staying. So older people, disabled people, children. So you've got an economy that's very unstable. Um, it, it's, I think beyond the scope of this conversation, talk about how do you solve Puerto Rico's uh, problems, uh, but I don't think the, the answer is for it to become a tax haven again. Hey, Steve, you mentioned you know that 75% of the capital is flowing to these three cities. Um, you kind of touched on this, but isn't that largely because that 
VC capital is flowing from these same three places. And I'm just wondering, you know, what would it actually tangibly take for investors to want to spend their capacity and their resources getting off their bicycle, right? Looking, um, looking outside of this because, you know, systematically right now, the talent is coming to them. And, um, and so it is, it is a big system issue. And I think, um, I think about Ashoka right now, who is targeting the same issue through the social entrepreneurship lens. And so they've just launched this All America initiative to focus on their fellowship coming into putting boots on the ground and, you know, sort of mining local talent outside of the bi-coastal Ivy League, you know, areas. Um, but it's, it takes, you know, effort and kind of being under the radar. And the idea is, you know, keeping the talent there because that's where the best problems can be solved. So I'm, I'm just thinking this concept, is it possible to scale it uh, and... If so, what would it take? Who would have to do it? What would really motivate, you know, VC capital to come that way? Would it have to be um, the government to take a first step in this way? I think it's uh, beginning to change. Uh, there's uh, last week I mentioned I was in, in Silicon Valley. I had a bunch of meetings with a bunch of uh, folks, including some of the most uh, prominent uh, venture capitalists and. Yeah, and the discussion's a little bit different than it was a couple of years ago. And even a couple of weeks ago, the cover of Economist talked about peak Silicon Valley and some of the trends around regional entrepreneurship. And, and you know, venture capitalists are beginning to realize they're partly because there are successes out there that they see that they weren't part of, and partly because they see, although there is a lot of talent in Silicon Valley, there's no question, there's not much loyalty. People bounce around a lot. It's, people, it's very expensive to attract and, and keep people. Uh, they're, they're, most of the companies now, including some of the biggest ones, Google and Facebook and others, are opening offices in other places, saying we don't want to be, you know, so reliant on, on just being in, in the Silicon Valley. And even, you know, the venture capitalists are now saying, you know, start maybe in, in, in Silicon Valley, if that's where you're based, but quickly figure out where to open a second office or a third office so you have a more distributed workforce. So that dynamic is beginning to kick in. I would expect that to accelerate over the next decade. The other dynamic that's, that's happening is they're now a couple hundred regional venture firms around the country, smallish 30, 40, 50 million dollar firms, which by Silicon Valley standards is, 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 is tiny, but in Lincoln, Nebraska or Des Moines, Iowa or something, these, are, these have real throw weight and are backing entrepreneurs in there. And our whole strategy with Rise Rest is to partner with them you know, have them lead these rounds and we'll be kind of a, a co-investor and then create a, try to be a catalyst and connect them to, to other people. So helping these, these smallish regional firms get larger and educating the coastal firms about the opportunities and ide indeed identifying, almost curating the opportunities for them, I think will result in this, in this uh, you know, changing over time. But it's, it's gonna you know, take, as I said before, uh, a, a number of years. I'm optimistic based on what we're seeing. I think we're seeing more and more examples in, in, in different cities that more and more investors are starting to open their mind to it. They still have a bias to invest where they are and it's more convenient for them and they have strong networks there. And, and, but they're beginning to realize that if they you know, just focus in their backyard, they're going to miss a lot of opportunities. You saw this a decade ago where some of the most prominent venture firms said uh, in Silicon Valley said we need to figure out a strategy around China. Many launched venture funds uh, there because that was a, a, a new frontier. And indeed, now, if you look at what's happened to venture capital just in the last decade, it's gone from overwhelmingly in the United States, over 80% in the United States, to now less than half in the United States. And actually, China, in particular, the amount of venture capital going into those companies is, is, is in some, some people say it may have passed the amount of venture capital going into the Silicon Valley companies. So a lot's changed quickly uh, globally and people are beginning to realize a lot may change uh, regionally also within the United States. And the core message here is innovation, entrepreneurship is both regionalizing within this country and globalizing. Uh, and if you're just focused on a few entrepreneurs in a few places, you're going to miss some of the you know, great opportunities of, of, of tomorrow. And ultimately, what drives investors is returns. And so if they're seeing that the, the returns are better elsewhere uh, because the valuations are lower and when they're successful, you know, kind of you kind of buy low, sell high, it's kind of pretty 
core to investing. That will lead more capital to flow to these entrepreneurs in these places as there are more successes. That will lead to kind of a network effect kicking in in some of these cities. So more people will stay, more people will return, more capital will be reinvested, more people will be paying attention, and you'll just see these you know, con continue to rise. At least that's our, our hope, and we'll do everything we can to try to turn that into a reality. Well, thank you. Let me take the liberty of the last question, and I was going to take us in a global direction. You know, not long ago when I was in uh, Beijing, I visited a $500 million angel fund, quite large uh, for an angel fund, uh, but um, not surprising that it's in China. And so I, I wonder if you both have thoughts on uh, how healthy is it for the United States? Uh, I mean, it seems to me we've always been an open investment climate. It's been uh, the strength of the U.S. economy that that's the case. So as you look at entrepreneurship around the world and you think about what kind of links can be built with the United States and are they enough and should we be welcoming that investment, do you have some final thoughts on that? You know, I think if you go back to where we started, right now, if you look where research and development dollars are going into robotics and other things, China's putting more money into those areas than we are. Uh, they're creating uh, some of the, the intellectual capital that entrepreneurs thrive on. Um, I don't know um, whether their system of intellectual property has progressed to the point where entrepreneurs can count on uh, enjoying the fruits of their success uh, as they can here. Uh, but the fact that venture capitalists feel comfortable investing there certainly suggests they've made some progress, at least in terms of the perception from where they were even 10 years ago. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing for the United States if other countries are innovating. I think it's a bad thing for the United States if we stop. You know, if, if, if we don't grow entrepreneurs and innovators, I'm pretty confident that if we keep doing the right things, we will remain competitive because we have a depth of, of knowledge, talent, and uh, the tradition of entrepreneurship and risk taking that's so deep. But we don't get to take a decade or two off. And I'm worried, I'm worried that in terms of things like research and development, in terms of infrastructure, we may well be taking a decade or two off. And that is uh, you know, dangerous. It's dangerous if we do it in education because you know, the next generation won't have the skills they need. So I would worry more about what we do than I would lament what others are doing successfully. I agree with that. I think, I think uh, China is on the move. And the, you know, the level of investment, the level of innovation is, is uh, significant. And you know, you'd often hear, even five years ago, certainly 10 years ago, people say, oh, like China, they're, they're good at replicating stuff. But they're not good at inventing stuff. You know, the invention will always be like Apple and Silicon Valley, but then they'll have them manufacture the iPads in, in, in China. You don't hear that so much. You know, you, you, the level of, as Jack said, no, no investment in robotics, AI, other, other fields is, is quite significant, and the level of creativity and innovation is quite you know, significant. So I do think we are at risk. I do think there is, I'm optimistic, and, you know, but I do think that there is a risk that this country loses its lead as the most innovative nation. And I think there, if we, if we do, uh, and we kind of look back, I think we will kind of kick ourselves saying, kind of what were we thinking that we were not backing entrepreneurs everywhere and only backing entrepreneurs in a few places? What were we thinking that we couldn't figure out some way to, you know, kind of on the policy front kind of work together in a bipartisan way to actually deal with real issues in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a significant way. It's, it's, actually, it, it would, it's almost like we, if we end up losing, and I hope we won't, but if we end up losing, it's kind of an own goal kind of thing. We, we, we have lost it because of our inability to continue to, you know, to win it. So I think it's, it's something that we all need to be sensitive to. I, I'm pretty sure if nothing changes, and the way Washington works is the same, and the way venture capitalists invest is the same, that 25 years from now, we will not be the most innovative entrepreneur nation in the world. Pretty sure of that, actually. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure of it. But I also know that it can change. And I love the Winston Churchill quote that 
America always gets it right in the long run, but has to try every other option first. So hopefully some of the things we're doing are paths to recognizing this is a challenge, uh, but also an opportunity, and hopefully including some folks here in this room will be the ones who kind of, whether it be on the innovation front or the policy front or the whatever front, are the ones that will figure this out so we can continue to kind of lead the way. Well, thank you. You have brought us together, uh, which is a wonderful thing as well. We thank you so much. Thank you, Jack, as well. Please join me in thanking Steve Case and Jack Lee.